Next on Currents News, bishops from all over the world joining in battle against clerical sex abuse. We have team coverage of the historic Vatican Summit. Not far away, a vigil tonight for those who have been abused. These steep steps are difficult to climb, but for somebody using a wheelchair or a stroller, they can be impossible. I'm Emily Druby, and coming up, we'll show you just how accessible New York City is through the eyes of one family. Plus, the fast-breaking developments involving actor Jesse Smollett now charged in connection with a suspected fake hate crime. The news starts right now. This is sacred ground where we meet Jesus on the cross. That we mean business. The Pope's top sex abuse investigator, Archbishop Charles Shakluna, at today's opening of the historic Sex Abuse Summit. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Faubles. Pope Francis summoned bishops from around the world to confront the global crisis over the next four days at the Vatican. The stakes are high for the Church and for the Holy Father. Currents News' Tim Harfman is here with highlights of day one. Tim. Liz, the Pope was front and center this morning, telling nearly 200 co top Catholic leaders they're under a microscope and must act. The Santo Popolo di Dio ci guarda e attende da noi non semplici e scontate condanne, ma misure concrete ed efficaci da predisporre. Ci vuole concretezza. The central theme on day one, knowing the pain of abuse survivors and healing their wounds. Manila Cardinal Luis Tagle spoke about them. Regarding the victims, we need to help them to express their deep hurts and to he heal from them. Regarding the perpetrators, we need to serve justice. The four-day summit is historic, intended to confront the abuse scandals that have erupted around the world. Out of sight of TV cameras behind closed doors this morning, the bishops heard from five people, including a priest who endured abuse. A summit organizer, Father Hans Zollner, described the experience. Once you listen with open mind, open ears, and open heart, you cannot be, remain as you are. You, you are transformed. Cardinal Tagle addressed past failures by the church to listen to survivors. Our lack of response to the suffering of victims even to the point of rejecting them and covering up the scandal to protect perpetrators and the institution has injured our people. By gathering the top bishops from every diocese on the globe, Francis is hoping to accomplish more than past attempts to eradicate abuse that were mostly unsuccessful. Archbishop Shakluna is the Vatican's chief prosecutor against abuse, and he assured Catholics this time the church is serious. The faith community under our care should know that we mean business. Shakluna helped set up the summit, and he laid out basic steps that must be followed to confront predators. It is essential that the community be advised that they have the duty and the right to report sexual misconduct to a contact person in the diocese or a disorder. After the day's formal proceedings concluded, the Archbishop attended a press conference and talked about meeting the needs of survivors. We cannot leave the victims without information. We can't leave them without knowing how the process has concluded. It is a lack of respect for the victims. This summit is likely the most important event of the Francis Papacy and will have a direct impact on his moral authority and his legacy as Pontiff. Liz. Thank you so much, Tim. At the Vatican to cover this historic event is the national correspondent for the tablet and crux, Christopher White. He joins us now. Christopher, nice to have you here. Hi, Liz. Thanks. Pope, Glad to be with you. Pope Francis hit the ground running this morning. First, let's listen to him once again. The Santo Popolo di Dio ci guarda e attende da noi non semplici e scontate condanne, ma misure concrete ed efficaci da predisporre. Christopher, strong words there from Francis calling for concrete action. What exactly does that mean? What actions are actually being considered? 
Well, Liz, that's right. The Pope answer, uh, started today with a real salvo saying we, we have to go back to our people, uh, that they know that we're going to go home with real actions. And, and he really reflected on 21 points that the group came together and discussed, starting with new guidelines for bishop accountability, so that it's, it's not just the crime of sexual abuse, it's also the cover-up. And he wants church law to reflect that. Uh, and he's made it quite clear that all dioceses around the world are going to have to revise their new standards. Uh, in order to reflect what comes out of these days ahead. Christopher, 21 points, very comprehensive. What's been the reaction to that so far? Well, it's, I, I think most people didn't expect such, you know, uh, a, a high number today of, of those points. And I, I think we've had survivors sort of being pleased with that, uh, saying these aren't just symbolic gestures, uh, but these are real measures that perhaps can actually lead to substantive change. So, so far, the mood has been very positive. Chris, today's main theme is responsibility. Manila Cardinal Luis Tagle focused on the hurt that's been caused by bishops. Listen up. We humbly and sorrowfully admit that wounds have been inflicted by us bishops on the victims and in fact the entire body of Christ. As a follow-up to that, Christopher, how did Cardinal Tagle suggest that bishops heal wounds? Well, Liz, the, the Cardinal's remarks were emotional. At one point, he cried today, uh, reflecting on, on the pain of victims, saying that they, they, were, they represented Christ being crucified. Uh, and uh, to do that, he said, first, we have to listen and let the, the testimony of survivors shape the church's response, not the other way around. Christopher, you're talking about this emotion. You're talking about tears. The Pope's sex abuse point man, Archbishop Charles Shakluna, he's speaking about Bishop's responsibility. Give us a recap of that. That's right. Archbishop Shakluna's re, uh, t reflections today were really concrete. Uh, he said, when we leave this, we have to go back and, and revise our, our guidelines, and we have to find new ways to work with state officials here. So it's not just civil uh, or church lawyers. It's church lawyers being willing to cooperate uh, with investigations with, you know, with real teeth. And a very, very important component to this entire summit. Participants also hearing from survivors of sexual abuse. What was their message? Yeah, Liz, there's a, a number of powerful reflections today, and we don't know the names of these people because they, for their own protection, they wanted to remain anonymous. But we heard one account uh, of a, a woman who had been uh, sexually abused for years by a priest who, on three occasions impregnated her and forced her to have abortions. Uh, you know, multiple bishops sort of, uh, you know, tearing up, crying openly. Uh, and I think that, you know, that sort of emotion really marked the entire day. Christopher, when you look around and you see the emotions, not just from the prelates, but from the survivors, what does that do to the mood of this summit? Has it shifted from business now to personal? Yeah, I think, Liz, that's a fair assessment that this is really a, a personal listening session first and foremost. Yes, we want action, but the action is going to be driven by the stories and real life experience of these victims uh, because this is where they feel affo affirmed that their vulnerable past can really shape a new direction for the church. All right, Christopher, thank you so much for that update on the summit so far. We certainly will be talking with you a little bit more, but um, appreciate it, my friend. Thank you, Liz. Tonight, a vigil for all the victims who suffered at the hands of predators in the church held near the Vatican at Castel Sant'Angelo. And that's where Melissa Butts is standing by to report on what happened. Melissa. At the end of the first day of the Summit on Sexual Abuse, activists and survivors are raising their voice here at Castel San Angelo to address a problem they say still exists surrounding the issue of sexual abuse. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> what began as a silent demonstration and twilight vigil quickly turned into a push for zero tolerance with survivor testimonies. We demand change. We demand zero tolerance for child abuse. Peter Isley was 13 in a Franciscan seminary. When he was asked to perform acts he said he had never even heard of. He used his voice to say no, but was tortured until he gave in. Torture taking place in our church by our priests, he comes back again. Again he makes that order. I tried to say no. What I'm not going to tell you is what happened after that. Because you can guess what eventually happened after that. 
There's only so much a limit a child can take. For me, it was the ultimate betrayal to be abused by a priest at 16. He abused me, not only abused, but he raped and impregnated me and paid for the abortion. And still practices, still in ministry. Some believed they were alone until they heard other victims speaking up, sharing their stories. For many years, I carried the shame. Uh, I carried it alone. I didn't tell anybody about it. Um, I was 10 years old when it happened to me. I thought I was alone. 40 years I covered it up. Today, here we are, being together, united, speaking in one voice for all those who can't speak for themselves. Now, they support each other in more ways than one, seeking healing and justice so the crisis of abuse ends completely. As the survivors say, they will continue to be present here in Rome these days, breaking the silence. In Rome, Melissa Butts, Currents News. Back to you in New York, Liz. Thank you, Melissa. One of the survivors in Melissa's report, Peter Isley, is also saying that the points discussed today at the summit do not support the concept of zero tolerance of sex abuse. This unprecedented summit continues for three more days, and the Pope will be on hand for everything. Tomorrow, the bishops tackle responsibility and perhaps bishops who fail to act on abuse cases. On day three, the clerics will discuss transparency and communications. The summit ends on Sunday with Mass and the Pope's closing remarks. Currents News will have team coverage. New fallout over the Theodore McCarrick after he was expelled from the priesthood. The disgraced ex-cardinal had received honorary degrees from several U.S. colleges. Now two top Catholic schools are stripping him of theirs. The University of Notre Dame and Georgetown University acted after the Vatican found McCarrick guilty of sex abuse. There's a lot more news headed your way. The struggle of getting to the subway for many New Yorkers, the obstacles are enormous. Tonight, an exclusive report. TV actor Jesse Smollett is charged in connection with what's being called a fake hate crime. Good news, a former runaway slave is on the path to sainthood. A big step has been taken in his cause. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. One, two, three. The subways move New York, but for many in the city, getting to the trains is a big struggle. A lot of stations lack accessibility. Few are equipped with elevator service, making it almost impossible for some to get from the street down to the train. A recent tragedy in Manhattan where a mom died carrying a stroller punctuated the problem. Currents News' Emily Druby has more in this exclusive report. Ready? Uh, yeah. When the Halleck's get their two kids ready for a day out, one thing they want to avoid, the subway. Hey, we really don't take the subway as a family. Sasha and his wife Sarah have a three-year-old son, Oliver, who sometimes uses a stroller, and a six-year-old son, Judah, who can't walk on his own. We would carry Judah down the stairs in his wheelchair, um, but as he got bigger and his wheelchair got heavier, that's just not possible. Um, and so that's really limited us in terms of the subway. They don't use the subway because at too many stations, there's no safe way to access the platform. Instead, they use the bus. Sasha tells us an elevator is being built here at their Eastern Parkway subway stop, but by the time it's done, they'll be in their next apartment facing the same problem. We will be near two subway stops and neither of them have elevators. The Halleck's just one of many families facing accessibility problems in New York City. A recent issue highlighted by the the death of Malaysia Goodson, a mom who passed away after falling down subway station stairs while carrying a stroller. All the times that I've walked up the steps carrying a baby in a stroller or carrying um, my son who's six years old and can't walk. What if something had gone wrong then? You know, how many times is there a little bit of water or ice even on the top of those steps? Um, it's pretty scary to think about. According to a 2018 report from the city comptroller's office, only 24% of the 472 subway stations citywide are accessible by an elevator, 
leaving many stuck. In Brooklyn, according to the report, there are 44 neighborhoods serviced by the subway, but 26 of those neighborhoods don't have a single accessible station. The Halleck say they're encouraged by recent steps taken by New York City Transit President Andy Byford, who's making accessibility a key point in his plans to quickly modernize services. But the Halleck's haven't seen any changes yet. On a day-to-day -day basis, we're still dealing with the same things. In Prospect Heights, Emily Druby, Currents News. TV actor Jesse Smollett is free on $100,000 bond tonight. He's facing a felony charge after telling Chicago police he was the victim of a hate crime. Omar Jimenez reports the city's top cop is furious over the alleged false report. I'm left hanging my head and asking why. Why would anyone, especially an African-American man, use the symbolism of a noose to make false accusations? Jesse Smollett is now facing a felony charge of disorderly conduct, and it all stems from his own claims that police now say are false. The black and gay star of the Fox show Empire alleges that in the early morning hours of January 29th, he was attacked by these men and claims they yelled racist and homophobic slurs, tied a rope around his neck, and poured an unknown substance on him. It was a story that set off a tidal wave of initial support from actors to presidential candidates. We gave him the benefit of the doubt up until that 47th hour. But when we discovered the actual motive, quite frankly, it, it pissed everybody off. As the investigation began to play out, police took these two brothers into custody as suspects. Their attorney showed up. After speaking with these two people of interest, she said that something smelled fishy. They were released without being charged. Phone records show Smollett spoke to the brothers before and after the attack. And police say Smollett paid these men $3,500 to stage the entire thing, reportedly unhappy with his salary on Empire. I only hope that the truth about what happened receives the same amount of attention that the hoax did. Omar Jimenez, Currents News. More coverage now on the groundbreaking Vatican summit to confront the worldwide clergy sex abuse scandals. Joining us now, Brooklyn Deacon Phil Franco. He's a survivor of abuse and an advisor to the Brooklyn Diocese Office of Victim Assistance. Deacon Franco, it's always so good to talk with you. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you for making the time. Let's get right to it. We're going to talk about the best and worst case scenarios for this summit. Let's begin with the best case. I think the best case scenario for this summit would be very serious uh, new uh, policies, perhaps written into canon law and therefore enforced, because individual bishops have a lot of autonomy in their own diocese. So I would like to see Rome really enforce real transparency uh, and not just punishments for clergy sex abuse, but also punishments and uh, ramifications for those who cover it up. Um, the best case scenario would be a scenario where um, you know, there's real repercussions, mm -hmm. and that would help to root out in the future. And the Holy Father talked about 21 guidelines that he's put out. We don't have the details of that yet, but it's very comprehensive. Right. The worst case scenario would be, given that. I think the worst case scenario would be just a token situation in which uh, perhaps guidelines are thrown out there that individual dioceses don't necessarily have to follow. Uh, or they could get around. Uh, I, I would hate to see that. I think okay. that would be the worst case scenario where perhaps this becomes mm -hmm. a meeting just for show. Cardinal Toggle talked about healing for survivors. Let's listen to that before you answer. Regarding the victims, we need to help them to express their deep hurts and to ha heal from them. You have a personal relationship to this story, obviously. Mm. Can bishops foster the type of healing that you as a survivor, as a victim, would need? Absolutely. I, I think bishops can foster it, but mm. it can't be bishops alone. It mm. has to be the parishes. It has to be lay people involved. It has to be survivors involved. Um, I think the bishop certainly can foster uh, an atmosphere of healing, an atmosphere of uh, care for those who uh, are survivors of sexual abuse. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, my experience, we've done here in Brooklyn a good job of that, but it's not uniform. And okay. I hope from Rome we get some uniformity now. Mm -hmm. Given that, uh, Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio, the Bishop of Brooklyn, has already taken a, a huge step to help the survivors. The diocese is releasing a list of clergy credibly accused of sexual abuse of a minor, and he has even spoken to parishioners about it. Let's listen. I have met with many victims who have told me that more than anything, they wanted an acknowledgement of what was done to them. 
This list gives that recognition. I hope it will add another means of healing for them on their journey towards wholeness. How important is that list? Very important. I think, like the bishop said, it's, it's just one step on the journey. It's not everything, but to see that in writing as a survivor, I can say on a personal level, to see it in writing is uh, very helpful and Are other survivors feeling the same way? In my experience, generally, yes. Mm -hmm. um, of course, like anything else, it has difficult consequences as well. There are some who saw names they didn't know about. There are some who saw names and said, wow, that's the priest who did my wedding or baptized my child, you know. Uh, so you can't expect it to be a perfect mm -hmm. scenario. But I think as survivors, uh, it was very therapeutic to see the names written. Um, you know, it's an affirmation of what you went through and it's an affirmation of your coming forward. Where do we go from here? How, how do you think we need to combat the sex abuse crisis really quickly? Uh, absolute transparency. Uh, we, we need real ongoing therapeutic availability, you know, and help for survivors. Mm -hmm. Uh, and zero tolerance. Absolutely, it doesn't matter if you're a cardinal, uh, bishop, priest, uh, zero tolerance for uh, abuse and its cover-up, okay. which are two distinct things which need to be remedied. All right, thank you so much, Deacon Franco. Again, always such a pleasure talking with thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. The Diocese of Brooklyn's website now has a special section where people can go to get all the information in one place. It includes the newly released clergy list as well as videos and resources. Go to dioceseofbrooklyn.org and on the home page, click on Clergy Sex Abuse Crisis Response. The toll-free and confidential sexual abuse reporting line you heard about in Tim's report is 888-634-4499. The latest on the crisis in Haiti. Five Americans held on weapons charges are out of jail tonight. They were detained over the weekend after the country's leader, Jovenel Moise, accused them of being terrorists armed with illegal firearms. The men are now in Miami. The U.S. government coordinated their release with Haitian authorities. Still to come on Currents News, the first African-American priest ordained in the U.S. gets unanimous approval in his sainthood cause, what that means. And from the street of Berlin all the way to Boston. A World War II vet takes one final ride in honor of his fallen brothers. We'll be right back. Augustus Tolton is one step closer to becoming a saint. The holy man was the first African-American to be ordained a Catholic priest in the U.S. The former runaway slave studied for the priesthood in Rome because no U.S. seminary would accept him. A nine-member Vatican Commission unanimously voted that Tolton's cause for sainthood move forward. Now the next steps would be beatification and then canonization. A World War II veteran from Massachusetts got a big surprise on Wednesday. The 95-year-old, also known as the Hero of Cologne, got a chance to ride in the same kind of Sherman tank he operated during the war. Clarence Smoyer was part of the Spearhead Division in the war and is now one of its last survivors. That tank saved my life. He's very famous for a battle in the streets of Cologne between the Panther, or uh, Panther German tank, and his Pershing tank where he took out a Panther. He's one of the few Americans who's ever done that. The streets of Boston were lined with American flags and people cheering, watching the famous vet take one final ride for himself and the men who never made it home. We thank him for his service. That is Currents News. I'm Liz Fobles. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.